The Dutch East India Company Dutch, de Compagnie, VOC, was an early megacorporation, founded by a government-directed amalgamation of several rival Dutch trading companies the so-called or pre-companies in the early 17th century. It was originally established, on 20 March 1602, as a chartered company to trade with India and Indianized Southeast Asian countries when the Dutch government granted it a 21-year monopoly on the Dutch spice trade. The VOC was an early multinational, transnational corporation in its modern sense. The company has been often labeled a trading company i.e. a company of merchants who buy and sell goods produced by other people or sometimes a shipping company. However, the VOC was in fact a proto-conglomerate company, diversifying into multiple commercial and industrial activities such as international trade especially intra-Asian trade, shipbuilding, both production and trade of East Indian spices, Formosan sugarcane, and South African wine. The company was a transcontinental employer and an early pioneer of outward foreign direct investment. The company's investment projects helped raise the commercial and industrial potential of many underdeveloped or undeveloped regions of the world in the early modern period. In the early 1600s, by widely issuing bonds and shares of stock to the general public, the VOC became the world's first formally listed public company. In other words, it was the first corporation to be ever actually listed on an official stock exchange. The VOC was influential in the rise of corporate-led globalization in the early modern period. With its pioneering institutional innovations and powerful roles in global business history, the company is often considered by many to be the forerunner of modern corporations. In many respects, modern-day corporations are all the direct descendants of the VOC model. It was the VOC's 17th-century institutional innovations and business practices that laid the foundations for the rise of giant global corporations in subsequent centuries. As a highly significant and formidable socio-politico-economic force of the modern-day world, to become the dominant factor in almost all economic systems today, whether for better or worse. The VOC also served as the direct model for the organizational reconstruction of the English-British East India Company in 1657. The company, for nearly 200 years of its existence 1602 to 1800, had effectively transformed itself from a corporate entity into a state or an empire in its own right. One of the most influential and best expertly researched business enterprises in history, the VOC's world has been the subject of a vast amount of literature that includes both fiction and non-fiction works. Dubbed the VOC Republic or VOC Empire by some, the company was historically an exemplary transcontinental company state rather than a pure for-profit corporation. Originally a government-backed military commercial enterprise, the VOC was the wartime brainchild of leading Dutch Republican statesman Johan van Oldenbarnveldt and the States General. From its inception in 1602, the company was not only a commercial enterprise but also effectively an instrument of war in the young Dutch Republic's revolutionary global war against the powerful Spanish Empire and Iberian Union 1579 to 1648. In 1619, the company forcibly established a central position in the Indonesian city of Jakarta, changing the name to Batavia, modern-day Jakarta. Over the next two centuries the company acquired additional ports as trading bases and safeguarded their interests by taking over surrounding territory. To guarantee its supply it established positions in many countries and became an early pioneer of outward foreign direct investment. In its foreign colonies the VOC possessed quasi-governmental powers, including the ability to wage war, imprison and execute convicts, negotiate treaties, strike its own coins, and establish colonies. With increasing importance of foreign posts, the company is often considered the world's first true transnational corporation. Along with the Dutch West India Company GWIC, the VOC became seen as the international arm of the Dutch Republic and the symbolic power of the Dutch Empire. 
to further its trade routes, the VOC funded exploratory voyages such as those led by Willem Jansoon, Doofken, Henry Hudson, Harve Maine, and Abel Tasman, who revealed largely unknown landmasses to the Western world. In the golden age of Netherlandish cartography, c. 1570s to 1670s, VOC navigators and cartographers helped shape geographical knowledge of the world as we know it today. Socioeconomic changes in Europe, the shift in power balance, and less successful financial management resulted in a slow decline of the VOC between 1720 and 1799. After the financially disastrous Fourth Anglo-Dutch War 1780 the company was first nationalised in 1796, and finally dissolved in 1799. All assets were taken over by the government with VOC territories becoming Dutch government colonies. In spite of the VOC's historic roles and contributions, the company has long been heavily criticized for its monopoly policy, exploitation, colonialism, uses of violence, and slavery. Topic: <laughs> Company name, logo, and flag. In Dutch the name of the company is Verenigde Oostindische Compagnie or Verenigde Oostindische Compagnie, abbreviated to VOC. The company's monogram logo was possibly in fact the first globally recognized corporate logo. The logo of the VOC consisted of a large capital V with an O on the left and a C on the right leg. It appeared on various corporate items, such as cannons and coins. The first letter of the hometown of the chamber conducting the operation was placed on top see figure for example of the Amsterdam Chamber logo. The monogram, versatility, flexibility, clarity, simplicity, symmetry, timelessness, and symbolism are considered notable characteristics of the VOC's professionally designed logo, those ensured its success at a time when the concept of the corporate identity was virtually unknown. An Australian vintner has used the VOC logo since the late 20th century, having re-registered the company's name for the purpose. The flag of the company was red, white, and blue see Dutch flag, with the company logo embroidered on it. Around the world and especially in English-speaking countries, the VOC is widely known as the Dutch East India Company. The name Dutch East India Company is used to make a distinction with the British East India Company (EIC) and other East Indian companies such as the Danish East India Company, French East India Company, Portuguese East India Company, and the Swedish East India Company. The company's alternative names that have been used include the Dutch East Indies Company, United East India Company, United East Indian Company, United East Indies Company, Jan Company, or Jan Compagnie. Topic: History. Topic: Origins. Before the Dutch Revolt, Antwerp had played an important role as a distribution centre in northern Europe. After 1591, however, the Portuguese used an international syndicate of the German Fuggers and Wellses, and Spanish and Italian firms, that used Hamburg as the northern staple port to distribute their goods, thereby cutting Dutch merchants out of the trade. At the same time, the Portuguese trade system was unable to increase supply to satisfy growing demand, in particular the demand for pepper. Demand for spices was relatively inelastic, and therefore each lag in the supply of pepper caused a sharp rise in pepper prices. In 1580 the Portuguese crown was united in a personal union with the Spanish crown, with which the Dutch Republic was at war. The Portuguese Empire therefore became an appropriate target for Dutch military incursions. These factors motivated Dutch merchants to enter the intercontinental spice trade themselves. Further, a number of Dutchmen like Jan Huygen van Linschoten and Cornelis de Houtman obtained first-hand knowledge of the secret Portuguese trade routes and practices, thereby providing opportunity. 
The stage was thus set for the four ship exploratory expedition by Frederick de Houtman in 1595 to Banton, the main pepper port of West Java, where they clashed with both the Portuguese and indigenous Indonesians. Houtman's expedition then sailed east along the north coast of Java, losing 12 crew to a Javanese attack at Sidayu and killing a local ruler in Madura. Half the crew were lost before the expedition made it back to the Netherlands the following year, but with enough spices to make a considerable profit. In 1598, an increasing number of fleets were sent out by competing merchant groups from around the Netherlands. Some fleets were lost, but most were successful, with some voyages producing high profits. In March 1599, a fleet of eight ships under Jacob van Neck was the first Dutch fleet to reach the Spice Islands of Maluku, the source of pepper, cutting out the Javanese middlemen. The ships returned to Europe in 1599 and 1600 and the expedition made a 400% profit. In 1600, the Dutch joined forces with the Muslim Hituese on Ambon Island in an anti Portuguese alliance, in return for which the Dutch were given the sole right to purchase spices from Hitu. Dutch control of Ambon was achieved when the Portuguese surrendered their fort in Ambon to the Dutch Hituese alliance. In 1613, the Dutch expelled the Portuguese from the Sola fort, but a subsequent Portuguese attack led to a second change of hands. Following this second reoccupation, the Dutch once again captured Sola. In 1636, east of Sola, on the island of Timor, Dutch advances were halted by an autonomous and powerful group of Portuguese Eurasians called the Topasses. They remained in control of the sandalwood trade and their resistance lasted throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, causing Portuguese Timor to remain under the Portuguese sphere of control. <laughs> Formation, rise, and fall <laughs> Formative years. At the time, it was customary for a company to be set up only for the duration of a single voyage and to be liquidated upon the return of the fleet. Investment in these expeditions was a very high risk venture, not only because of the usual dangers of piracy, disease and shipwreck, but also because the interplay of inelastic demand and relatively elastic supply of spices could make prices tumble at just the wrong moment, thereby ruining prospects of profitability. To manage such risk the forming of a cartel to control supply would seem logical. The English had been the first to adopt this approach, by bundling their resources into a monopoly enterprise, the English East India Company in 1600, thereby threatening their Dutch competitors with ruin. In 1602, the Dutch government followed suit, sponsoring the creation of a single, United East Indies Company, that was also granted monopoly over the Asian trade. For a time in the 17th century, they were able to monopolize the trade in nutmeg, mace, and cloves and to sell these spices in Europe and India at 14 to 17 times the price they paid in Indonesia. While Dutch profits soared, the local economy of the Spice Islands was destroyed. With a capital of 6,440,200 guilders, the charter of the new company empowered it to build forts, maintain armies, and conclude treaties with Asian rulers. It provided for a venture that would continue for 21 years, with a financial accounting only at the end of each decade. In February 1603, the company seized the Santa Catarina, a 1500 ton Portuguese merchant carrick, off the coast of Singapore. She was such a rich prize that her sale proceeds increased the capital of the VOC by more than 50%. Also in 1603 the first permanent Dutch trading post in Indonesia was established in Banten, West Java, and in 1611 another was established at Jayakarta later, Batavia, and then, Jakarta. In 1610, the VOC established the post of Governor-General to more firmly control their affairs in Asia. To advise and control the risk of despotic governors-general, a Council of the Indies was created. 
the Governor General effectively became the main administrator of the VOC's activities in Asia, although the Heeren 17, a body of 17 shareholders representing different chambers, continued to officially have overall control. VOC headquarters were located in Ambon during the tenures of the first three Governors General 1610 but it was not a satisfactory location. Although it was at the center of the spice production areas, it was far from the Asian trade routes and other VOC areas of activity ranging from Africa to India to Japan. A location in the west of the archipelago was thus sought. The Straits of Malacca were strategic but had become dangerous following the Portuguese conquest, and the first permanent VOC settlement in Banten was controlled by a powerful local ruler and subject to stiff competition from Chinese and English traders. In 1604, a second English East India Company voyage commanded by Sir Henry Middleton reached the islands of Ternet, Tidore, Ambon, and Banda. In Banda, they encountered severe VOC hostility, sparking Anglo-Dutch competition for access to spices. From 1611 to 1617, the English established trading posts at Sukadana southwest Kalimantan, Makassar, Jayakarta and Japara in Java, and Arche, Pariaman and Jambi in Sumatra, which threatened Dutch ambitions for a monopoly on East Indies trade. Diplomatic agreements in Europe in 1620 ushered in a period of cooperation between the Dutch and the English over the spice trade. This ended with a notorious but disputed incident known as the Amboina Massacre, where ten Englishmen were arrested, tried and beheaded for conspiracy against the Dutch government. Although this caused outrage in Europe and a diplomatic crisis, the English quietly withdrew from most of their Indonesian activities except trading in Banten and focused on other Asian interests. Growth. <laughs> <laughs> In 1619, Jan Pietersoen Cohen was appointed Governor-General of the VOC. He saw the possibility of the VOC becoming an Asian power, both political and economic. On 30 May 1619, Cohen, backed by a force of 19 ships, stormed Jayakarta, driving out the Banten forces, and from the ashes established Batavia as the VOC headquarters. In the 1620s almost the entire native population of the Banda Islands was driven away, starved to death, or killed in an attempt to replace them with Dutch plantations. These plantations were used to grow cloves and nutmeg for export. Cohen hoped to settle large numbers of Dutch colonists in the East Indies, but implementation of this policy never materialized, mainly because very few Dutch were willing to emigrate to Asia. Another of Cohen's ventures was more successful. A major problem in the European trade with Asia at the time was that the Europeans could offer few goods that Asian consumers wanted, except silver and gold. European traders therefore had to pay for spices with the precious metals, which were in short supply in Europe, except for Spain and Portugal. The Dutch and English had to obtain it by creating a trade surplus with other European countries. Cohen discovered the obvious solution for the problem, to start an intra-Asiatic trade system, whose profits could be used to finance the spice trade with Europe. In the long run this obviated the need for exports of precious metals from Europe, though at first it required the formation of a large trading capital fund in the Indies. The VOC reinvested a large share of its profits to this end in the period up to 1630. The VOC traded throughout Asia. Ships coming into Batavia from the Netherlands carried supplies for VOC settlements in Asia. Silver and copper from Japan were used to trade with India and China for silk, cotton, porcelain, and textiles. These products were either traded within Asia for the coveted spices or brought back to Europe. The VOC was also instrumental in introducing European ideas and technology to Asia. The company supported Christian missionaries and traded modern technology with China and Japan. A more peaceful VOC trade post on Dejima, an artificial island off the coast of Nagasaki, was for more than 200 years the only place where Europeans were permitted to trade with Japan. 
When the VOC tried to use military force to make Ming Dynasty China open up to Dutch trade, the Chinese defeated the Dutch in a war over the Pengu Islands from 1623 to 1624, forcing the VOC to abandon Pengu for Taiwan. The Chinese defeated the VOC again at the Battle of Liaoluo Bay in 1633. The Vietnamese Nguyen lords defeated the VOC in a 1643 battle during the Trinh Nguyen War, blowing up a Dutch ship. The Cambodians defeated the VOC in the Cambodian-Dutch War from 1643 to 1644 on the Mekong River. In 1640, the VOC obtained the port of Gaul, Ceylon, from the Portuguese and broke the latter's monopoly of the cinnamon trade. In 1658, Gerard Peters. Hulft laid siege to Colombo, which was captured with the help of King Rajasinghe II of Kandy. By 1659, the Portuguese had been expelled from the coastal regions, which were then occupied by the VOC, securing for it the monopoly over cinnamon. To prevent the Portuguese or the English from ever recapturing Sri Lanka, the VOC went on to conquer the entire Malabar coast from the Portuguese, almost entirely driving them from the west coast of India. When news of a peace agreement between Portugal and the Netherlands reached Asia in 1663, Goa was the only remaining Portuguese city on the west coast. In 1652, Jan van Riebeek established an outpost at the Cape of Good Hope, the southwestern tip of Africa, now Cape Town, South Africa, to resupply VOC ships on their journey to East Asia. This post later became a full-fledged colony, the Cape Colony, when more Dutch and other Europeans started to settle there. Through the 17th century VOC trading posts were also established in Persia, Bengal, Malacca, Siam, Formosa now Taiwan, as well as the Malabar and Coromandel coasts in India. Direct access to mainland China came in 1729 when a factory was established in Canton. In 1662, however, Coxinga expelled the Dutch from Taiwan see History of Taiwan. In 1663, the VOC signed the Painan Treaty with several local lords in the Painan area that were revolting against the Arche Sultanate. The treaty allowed the VOC to build a trading post in the area and eventually to monopolize the trade there, especially the gold trade. By 1669, the VOC was the richest private company the world had ever seen, with over 150 merchant ships, 40 warships, 50,000 employees, a private army of 10,000 soldiers, and a dividend payment of 40% on the original investment. Many of the VOC employees intermixed with the indigenous peoples and expanded the population of Indos in pre-colonial history. Reorientation Around 1670, two events caused the growth of VOC trade to stall. In the first place, the highly profitable trade with Japan started to decline. The loss of the outpost on Formosa to Coxinga in the 1662 siege of Fort Zealandia and related internal turmoil in China where the Ming dynasty was being replaced with the Qing dynasty, brought an end to the silk trade after 1666. Though the VOC substituted Bengali for Chinese silk other forces affected the supply of Japanese silver and gold. The shogunate enacted a number of measures to limit the export of these precious metals, in the process limiting VOC opportunities for trade, and severely worsening the terms of trade. Therefore, Japan ceased to function as the linchpin of the intra-Asiatic trade of the VOC by 1685. Even more importantly, the Third Anglo-Dutch War temporarily interrupted VOC trade with Europe. This caused a spike in the price of pepper, which enticed the English East India Company EIC to enter this market aggressively in the years after 1672. Previously, one of the tenets of the VOC pricing policy was to slightly oversupply the pepper market, so as to depress prices below the level where interlopers were encouraged to enter the market instead of striving for short-term profit maximization. The wisdom of such a policy was illustrated when a fierce price war with the EIC ensued, as that company flooded the market with new supplies from India. 
In this struggle for market share, the VOC, which had much larger financial resources, could wait out the EIC. Indeed, by 1683, the latter came close to bankruptcy, its share price plummeted from 600 to 250, and its president Josiah Child was temporarily forced from office, however, the writing was on the wall. Other companies, like the French East India Company and the Danish East India Company also started to make inroads on the Dutch system. The VOC therefore closed the heretofore flourishing open pepper emporium of Bantam by a treaty of 1684 with the Sultan. Also, on the Coromandel coast, it moved its chief stronghold from Pulakat to Negapitnam, so as to secure a monopoly on the pepper trade at the detriment of the French and the Danes. However, the importance of these traditional commodities in the Asian-European trade was diminishing rapidly at the time. The military outlays that the VOC needed to make to enhance its monopoly were not justified by the increased profits of this declining trade. Nevertheless, this lesson was slow to sink in, and at first, the VOC made the strategic decision to improve its military position on the Malabar coast, hoping thereby to curtail English influence in the area and end the drain on its resources from the cost of the Malabar garrisons by using force to compel the Zamorin of Calicut to submit to Dutch domination. In 1710, the Zamorin was made to sign a treaty with the VOC undertaking to trade exclusively with the VOC and expel other European traders. For a brief time, this appeared to improve the company's prospects. However, in 1715, with EIC encouragement, the Zamorin renounced the treaty. Though a Dutch army managed to suppress this insurrection temporarily, the Zamorin continued to trade with the English and the French, which led to an appreciable upsurge in English and French traffic. The VOC decided in 1721 that it was no longer worth the trouble to try to dominate the Malabar pepper and spice trade. A strategic decision was taken to scale down the Dutch military presence and in effect yield the area to EIC influence. The 1741 Battle of Collishell by warriors of Travancore under Raja Marthanda Varma defeated the Dutch. The Dutch commander Captain Eustachius de Lannoy was captured. Marthanda Varma agreed to spare the Dutch captain's life on condition that he joined his army and trained his soldiers on modern lines. This defeat in the Travancore Dutch War is considered the earliest example of an organized Asian power overcoming European military technology and tactics, and it signaled the decline of Dutch power in India. The attempt to continue as before as a low volume, high profit business enterprise with its core business in the spice trade had therefore failed. The company had however already reluctantly followed the example of its European competitors in diversifying into other Asian commodities, like tea, coffee, cotton, textiles, and sugar. These commodities provided a lower profit margin and therefore required a larger sales volume to generate the same amount of revenue. This structural change in the commodity composition of the VOC's trade started in the early 1680s, after the temporary collapse of the EIC around 1683 offered an excellent opportunity to enter these markets. The actual cause for the change lies, however, in two structural features of this new era. In the first place, there was a revolutionary change in the tastes affecting European demand for Asian textiles, coffee and tea, around the turn of the 18th century. Secondly, a new era of an abundant supply of capital at low interest rates suddenly opened around this time. The second factor enabled the company easily to finance its expansion in the new areas of commerce. Between the 1680s and 1720s, the VOC was therefore able to equip and man an appreciable expansion of its fleet, and acquire a large amount of precious metals to finance the purchase of large amounts of Asian commodities, for shipment to Europe. The overall effect was approximately to double the size of the company. The tonnage of the returning ships rose by 125% in this period. However, the company's revenues from the sale of goods landed in Europe rose by only 78%. This reflects the basic change in the VOC's circumstances that had occurred. It now operated in new markets for goods with an elastic demand, in which it had to compete on an equal footing with other suppliers. 
this made for low profit margins. Unfortunately, the business information systems of the time made this difficult to discern for the managers of the company, which may partly explain the mistakes they made from hindsight. This lack of information might have been counteracted as in earlier times in the VOC's history by the business acumen of the directors. Unfortunately by this time these were almost exclusively recruited from the political regent class, which had long since lost its close relationship with merchant circles. Low profit margins in themselves do not explain the deterioration of revenues. To a large extent the costs of the operation of the VOC had a fixed character military establishments, maintenance of the fleet and such. Profit levels might therefore have been maintained if the increase in the scale of trading operations that in fact took place had resulted in economies of scale. However, though larger ships transported the growing volume of goods, labor productivity did not go up sufficiently to realize these. In general the company's overhead rose in step with the growth in trade volume, declining gross margins translated directly into a decline in profitability of the invested capital. The era of expansion was one of «profitless growth». Specifically, t he long-term average annual profit in the VOC's 1630-70 golden age was 2.1 million guilders, of which just under half was distributed as dividends and the remainder reinvested. The long-term average annual profit in the expansion age 1680-1730 was 2. 0 million guilders, of which three quarters was distributed as dividend and one quarter reinvested. In the earlier period, profits averaged 18% of total revenues, in the latter period, 10%. The annual return of invested capital in the earlier period stood at approximately 6%, in the latter period, 3.4%. Nevertheless, in the eyes of investors the VOC did not do too badly. The share price hovered consistently around the 400 mark from the mid-1680s excepting a hiccup around the Glorious Revolution in 1688, and they reached an all-time high of around 642 in the 1720s. VOC shares then yielded a return of 3.5%, only slightly less than the yield on Dutch government bonds. Decline and fall After 1730, the fortunes of the VOC started to decline. Five major problems, not all of equal weight, explain its decline over the next 50 years to 1780. There was a steady erosion of intra-Asiatic trade because of changes in the Asiatic political and economic environment that the VOC could do little about. These factors gradually squeezed the company out of Persia, Sarate, the Malabar coast, and Bengal. The company had to confine its operations to the belt it physically controlled, from Ceylon through the Indonesian archipelago. The volume of this intra-Asiatic trade, and its profitability, therefore had to shrink. The way the company was organized in Asia centralized on its hub in Batavia, that initially had offered advantages in gathering market information, began to cause disadvantages in the 18th century because of the inefficiency of first shipping everything to this central point. This disadvantage was most keenly felt in the tea trade, where competitors like the EIC and the Ostend Company shipped directly from China to Europe. The venality of the VOC's personnel in the sense of corruption and non-performance of duties, though a problem for all East India companies at the time, seems to have plagued the VOC on a larger scale than its competitors. To be sure, the company was not a good employer. Salaries were low, and private account trading was officially not allowed. Not surprisingly, it proliferated in the 18th century to the detriment of the company's performance. From about the 1790s onward, the phrase perished under corruption also abbreviated VOC in Dutch came to summarize the company's future. A problem that the VOC shared with other companies was the high mortality and morbidity rates among its employees. This decimated the company's ranks and enervated many of the survivors. 
A self-inflicted wound was the VOC's dividend policy. The dividends distributed by the company had exceeded the surplus it garnered in Europe in every decade from 1690 to 1760 except 1710 to 1720. However, in the period up to 1730 the directors shipped resources to Asia to build up the trading capital there. Consolidated bookkeeping therefore probably would have shown that total profits exceeded dividends. In addition, between 1700 and 1740 the company retired 5.4 million guilders of long-term debt. The company therefore was still on a secure financial footing in these years. This changed after 1730. While profits plummeted the Bewindhebers only slightly decreased dividends from the earlier level. Distributed dividends were therefore in excess of earnings in every decade but one 1760 to, 1770. to accomplish this, the Asian capital stock had to be drawn down by 4 million guilders between 1730 and 1780, and the liquid capital available in Europe was reduced by 20 million guilders in the same period. The directors were therefore constrained to replenish the company's liquidity by resorting to short-term financing from anticipatory loans, backed by expected revenues from home-bound fleets. Despite these problems, the VOC in 1780 remained an enormous operation. Its capital in the Republic, consisting of ships and goods in inventory, totaled 28 million guilders, its capital in Asia, consisting of the liquid trading fund and goods en route to Europe, totaled 46 million guilders. Total capital, net of outstanding debt, stood at 62 million guilders. The prospects of the company at this time therefore were not hopeless, had one of the plans for reform been undertaken successfully. However, the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War intervened. British attacks in Europe and Asia reduced the VOC fleet by half, removed valuable cargo from its control, and devastated its remaining power in Asia. The direct losses of the VOC can be calculated at 43 million guilders. Loans to keep the company operating reduced its net assets to zero. From 1720 on, the market for sugar from Indonesia declined as the competition from cheap sugar from Brazil increased. European markets became saturated. Dozens of Chinese sugar traders went bankrupt, which led to massive unemployment, which in turn led to gangs of unemployed coolies. The Dutch government in Batavia did not adequately respond to these problems. In 1740, rumors of deportation of the gangs from the Batavia area led to widespread rioting. The Dutch military searched houses of Chinese in Batavia for weapons. When a house accidentally burnt down, military and impoverished citizens started slaughtering and pillaging the Chinese community. This massacre of the Chinese was deemed sufficiently serious for the board of the VOC to start an official investigation into the government of the Dutch East Indies for the first time in its history. After the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War, the VOC was a financial wreck. After vain attempts at reorganization by the provincial states of Holland and Zeeland, it was nationalized by the new Batavian Republic on 1 March 1796. The VOC charter was renewed several times, but was allowed to expire on 31 December 1799. Most of the possessions of the former VOC were subsequently occupied by Great Britain during the Napoleonic Wars, but after the new United Kingdom of the Netherlands was created by the Congress of Vienna, some of these were restored to this successor state of the Dutch Republic by the Anglo-Dutch Treaty of 1814. Topic: Organizational structure. The VOC is generally considered to be the world's first truly transnational corporation, and it was also the first multinational enterprise to issue shares of stock to the public. Some historians, such as Timothy Brook and Russell Shorto, consider the VOC as the pioneering corporation in the first wave of the corporate globalization era. The VOC was the first multinational corporation to operate officially in different continents such as Europe, Asia and Africa. 
while the VOC mainly operated in what later became the Dutch East Indies modern Indonesia, the company also had important operations elsewhere. It employed people from different continents and origins in the same functions and working environments. Although it was a Dutch company its employees included not only people from the Netherlands, but also many from Germany and from other countries as well. Besides the diverse Northwest European workforce recruited by the VOC in the Dutch Republic, the VOC made extensive use of local Asian labor markets. As a result, the personnel of the various VOC offices in Asia consisted of European and Asian employees. Asian or Eurasian workers might be employed as sailors, soldiers, writers, carpenters, smiths, or as simple unskilled workers. At the height of its existence the VOC had 25,000 employees who worked in Asia and 11,000 who were en route. Also, while most of its shareholders were Dutch, about a quarter of the initial shareholders were Zoud Nederlanders people from an area that includes modern Belgium and Luxembourg and there were also a few dozen Germans. The VOC had two types of shareholders, the participanten, who could be seen as non-managing members, and the 76 Bewindhebers later reduced to 60 who acted as managing directors. This was the usual setup for Dutch joint stock companies at the time. The innovation in the case of the VOC was that the liability of not just the participanten but also of the bewindhebbers was limited to the paid in capital usually, bewindhebbers had unlimited liability. The VOC therefore was a limited liability company. Also, the capital would be permanent during the lifetime of the company. As a consequence, investors that wished to liquidate their interest in the interim could only do this by selling their share to others on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange. Confusion of Confusions, a 1688 dialogue by the Sephardi Jew Joseph de la Vega analyzed the workings of this one stock exchange. The VOC consisted of six chambers cameras in port cities Amsterdam, Delft, Rotterdam, Enkhuizen, Middelburg, and Horn. Delegates of these chambers convened as the Heeren 17, the Lords 17. They were selected from the Bewindheber class of shareholders. Of the Heeren 17, eight delegates were from the Chamber of Amsterdam, one short of a majority on its own, four from the Chamber of Zeeland, and one from each of the smaller chambers, while the 17th seat was alternatively from the Chamber of Middelburg Zeeland or rotated among the five small chambers. Amsterdam had thereby the decisive voice. The Zeelanders in particular had misgivings about this arrangement at the beginning. The fear was not unfounded, because in practice it meant Amsterdam stipulated what happened. The six chambers raised the start-up capital of the Dutch East India Company. The raising of capital in Rotterdam did not go so smoothly. A considerable part originated from inhabitants of Dordrecht. Although it did not raise as much capital as Amsterdam or Middelburg Zeeland, Enkhuizen had the largest input in the share capital of the VOC. Under the first 358 shareholders, there were many small entrepreneurs, who dared to take the risk. The minimum investment in the VOC was 3,000 guilders, which priced the company's stock within the means of many merchants. Among the early shareholders of the VOC, immigrants played an important role. Under the 1,143 tenderers were 39 Germans and no fewer than 301 from the southern Netherlands roughly present Belgium and Luxembourg, then under Habsburg rule, of whom Isaac Le Maire was the largest subscriber with 85,000 guilders. VOC's total capitalization was ten times that of its British rival. The Heeren 17, Lord 17 met alternately six years in Amsterdam and two years in Middelburg Zeeland. They defined the VOC's general policy and divided the tasks among the chambers. The chambers carried out all the necessary work, built their own ships and warehouses and traded the merchandise. The Heeren 17 sent the ship's masters off with extensive instructions on the route to be navigated, prevailing winds, currents, shoals and landmarks. The VOC also produced its own charts. 
In the context of the Dutch-Portuguese War the company established its headquarters in Batavia, Java now Jakarta, Indonesia. Other colonial outposts were also established in the East Indies, such as on the Maluku Islands, which include the Banda Islands, where the VOC forcibly maintained a monopoly over nutmeg and mace. Methods used to maintain the monopoly involved extortion and the violent suppression of the native population, including mass murder. In addition, VOC representatives sometimes used the tactic of burning spice trees to force indigenous populations to grow other crops, thus artificially cutting the supply of spices like nutmeg and cloves. <laughs> VOC outposts Organization and leadership structures were varied as necessary in the various VOC outposts. Opperhoot is a Dutch word place. Opperhoofden, which literally means supreme chief. In this VOC context, the word is a gubernatorial title, comparable to the English chief factor, for the chief executive officer of a Dutch factory in the sense of trading post, as led by a factor, i.e. agent. See more at VOC Opperhoofden in Japan. Topic: <coughs> Council of Justice in Batavia. The Council of Justice in Batavia was the appellate court for all the other VOC company posts in the VOC Empire. Topic. Shareholder activism at the VOC and the beginnings of modern corporate governance problems The 17th century Dutch businessmen, especially the VOC investors, were possibly the history's first recorded investors to seriously consider the corporate governance's problems. Isaac Le Maire, who is known as history's first recorded short seller, was also a sizable shareholder of the VOC. In 1609, he complained of the VOC's shoddy corporate governance. On 24 January 1609, Le Maire filed a petition against the VOC, marking the first recorded expression of shareholder activism. In what is the first recorded corporate governance dispute, Le Maire formally charged that the VOC's board of directors the here and 17 sought to retain another's money for longer or use it ways other than the latter wishes and petitioned for the liquidation of the VOC in accordance with standard business practice. Initially the largest single shareholder in the VOC and a bewindheber sitting on the board of governors, Le Maire apparently attempted to divert the firm's profits to himself by undertaking 14 expeditions under his own accounts instead of those of the company. Since his large shareholdings were not accompanied by greater voting power, Le Maire was soon ousted by other governors in 1605 on charges of embezzlement, and was forced to sign an agreement not to compete with the VOC. Having retained stock in the company following this incident, in 1609 Le Maire would become the author of what is celebrated as first recorded expression of shareholder advocacy at a publicly traded company. In 1622, the history's first recorded shareholder revolt also happened among the VOC investors who complained that the company account books had been smeared with bacon so that they might be eaten by dogs. The investors demanded a reckoning, a proper financial audit. The 1622 campaign by the shareholders of the VOC is a testimony of genesis of corporate social responsibility CSR in which shareholders staged protests by distributing pamphlets and complaining about management self-enrichment and secrecy. Topic: <laughs> Main trading posts, settlements and colonies. Europe Netherlands Amsterdam Global Headquarters Delft Enkhuizen 
Horn Middleburg Rotterdam Topic Africa Topic Mauritius Dutch Mauritius 1638 to 1658 1664 to 1710 Topic South Africa Dutch Cape Colony 1652 to 1806 Topic Asia Topic Indonesia Batavia Dutch East Indies Topic Indian Subcontinent Dutch Coromandel, sixteen oh eight to eighteen twenty five Dutch Serate, sixteen sixteen to eighteen twenty five Dutch Bengal, sixteen twenty seven to eighteen twenty five Dutch Ceylon, sixteen forty to seventeen ninety six Dutch Malabar, sixteen sixty one to seventeen ninety five Topic Japan Harado, Nagasaki, sixteen oh nine to sixteen forty one Dejima, Nagasaki, sixteen forty one to eighteen fifty three Topic Taiwan Anping, Fort Zealandia Tainan, Fort Provincia Wangan, Pengu, Pescadores Islands, Fort Vlissingen, sixteen twenty to sixteen twenty four Keelung, Fort Nord Holland, Fort Victoria Tamsui, Fort Antonio Topic Malaysia Dutch Malacca, sixteen forty one to seventeen ninety five, eighteen eighteen to eighteen twenty five Topic Thailand Ayutthaya, sixteen oh eight to seventeen sixty seven. Topic Vietnam Thang Long, Tonkin, sixteen thirty six to sixteen ninety nine Hoyan, sixteen thirty six to seventeen forty one. Topic Conflicts and Wars involving the VOC The history of VOC commercial conflict, for example with the British East India Company EIC, was at times closely connected to Dutch military conflicts. The commercial interests of the VOC and more generally the Netherlands were reflected in military objectives and the settlements agreed by treaty. In the Treaty of Breda 1667 ending the Second Anglo-Dutch War, the Dutch were finally able to secure a VOC monopoly for nutmeg trade, ceding the island of Manhattan to the British while gaining the last non-VOC-controlled source of nutmeg, the island of Rheen in the Banda Islands. The Dutch later recaptured Manhattan, but returned it along with the colony of New Netherland in the Treaty of Westminster 1674 ending the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War. The British also gave up claims on Suriname as part of the Treaty of Westminster. There was also an effort to compensate the war-related losses of the Dutch West India Company in the mid-17th century by the profits of the VOC, though this was ultimately blocked. Military conflicts involving the VOC not necessarily comprehensive. Eighty Years' War, Dutch War of Independence 1568-1648 Sino-Dutch conflicts, 1620s minus 1662. Second Anglo-Dutch War, 1665 to 1667. Third Anglo-Dutch War, 1672 to 74. Fourth Anglo-Dutch War, 1780 to 84. 
Cambodian Dutch War 1643 to 1644 Trinh Nguyen War 1627 to 1673 Siege of Gaul 1640 Kediri Campaign 1678 Battle of Surabaya 1677 Battle of Macau 1622 Battle of Cape Rechado Battle of Vagan 1665 Battle of Chinshora 1759 Battle of Collishell 1741 Siege of Batavia 1628 Battle of Liaoluo Bay 1633 Battle of Goa 1638 Siege of Fort Fongwe 1624 versus Ming Empire Dutch Portuguese War 1601 to 1661 Javanese Wars of Succession 1677 to 1707 1719 to 1722 1749 to 1755 Malayan Portuguese War 1511 to 1641 Sinhalese Portuguese War 1527 to 1658 Khoi Khoi Dutch Wars 1659-1673-1674-1677 Travancore Dutch War 1739-1741 Invasion of the Cape Colony 1795 Dutch Conquest of the Banda Islands 1621 Dutch Pacification Campaign on Formosa 1635-1636 Kosa Wars 1779 to 1879 Historical roles and legacy In terms of global business history, the lessons from the VOC's successes or failures are critically important. In his book Amsterdam, A History of the World's Most Liberal City 2013, American author and historian Russell Shorto summarizes the VOC's importance in world history. Like the oceans it mastered, the VOC had a scope that is hard to fathom. One could craft a defensible argument that no company in history has had such an impact on the world. Its surviving archives, in Cape Town, Colombo, Chennai, Jakarta, and The Hague—have been measured by a consortium applying for a UNESCO grant to preserve them in kilometers. In innumerable ways the VOC both expanded the world and brought its far-flung regions together. It introduced Europe to Asia and Africa, and vice versa while its sister multinational, the West India Company, set New York City in motion and colonized Brazil and the Caribbean islands. It pioneered globalization and invented what might be the first modern bureaucracy. It advanced cartography and shipbuilding. It fostered disease, slavery, and exploitation on a scale never before imaged. A pioneering early model of the multinational corporation in its modern sense, the company is also considered to be the world's first true transnational corporation. In the early 1600s, the VOC became the world's first formally listed public company because it was the first corporation to be ever actually listed on a formal stock exchange. The VOC had a massive influence on the evolution of the modern corporation by creating an institutional prototype for subsequent large-scale business enterprises in particular large corporations like multinational, transnational, global corporations and their rise to become a highly significant socio-politico-economic force of the modern world as we know it today. In many respects, modern-day publicly listed global companies including Forbes Global 2000 companies are all descendants of a business model pioneered by the VOC in the 17th century. Like modern-day major corporations, in many ways, the post-1657 English, British East India Company's operational structure was a derivative of the earlier VOC model. During its golden age, the company played crucial roles in business, financial, socio-politico-economic, military-political, diplomatic, ethnic, and exploratory maritime history of the world. 
In the early modern period, the VOC was also the driving force behind the rise of corporate-led globalization, corporate power, corporate identity, corporate culture, corporate social responsibility, corporate ethics, corporate governance, corporate finance, corporate capitalism, and finance capitalism. With its pioneering institutional innovations and powerful roles in world history, the company is considered by many to be the first major, first modern, first global, most valuable, and most influential corporation ever seen. The VOC was also arguably the first historical model of the megacorporation. Institutional innovations and impacts on modern-day global business practices and financial system The VOC played a crucial role in the rise of corporate-led globalization, corporate governance, corporate identity, corporate social responsibility, corporate finance, modern entrepreneurship, and financial capitalism. During its golden age, the company made some fundamental institutional innovations in economic and financial history. These financially revolutionary innovations allowed a single company like the VOC to mobilize financial resources from a large number of investors and create ventures at a scale that had previously only been possible for monarchs. In the words of Canadian historian and sinologist Timothy Brook, the Dutch East India Company, the VOC, as it is known, is to corporate capitalism what Benjamin Franklin's kite is to electronics, the beginning of something momentous that could not have been predicted at the time. The birth and growth of the VOC, especially in the 17th century, is considered by many to be the official beginning of the corporate globalization era with the rise of large-scale business enterprises, multinational, transnational corporations in particular, as a highly formidable socio-politico-economic force that significantly affects people's lives in every corner of the world today, whether for better or worse. As the world's first publicly traded company and first listed company the first company to be ever listed on an official stock exchange, the VOC was the first company to issue stock and bonds to the general public. Considered by many experts to be the world's first truly modern multinational corporation, the VOC was also the first permanently organized limited liability joint stock company, with a permanent capital base. The VOC shareholders were the pioneers in laying the basis for modern corporate governance and corporate finance. The VOC is often considered as the precursor of modern corporations, if not the first truly modern corporation. It was the VOC that invented the idea of investing in the company rather than in a specific venture governed by the company. With its pioneering features such as corporate identity first globally recognized corporate logo, entrepreneurial spirit, legal personhood, transnational multinational operational structure, high and stable profitability, permanent capital fixed capital stock, freely transferable shares and tradable securities, separation of ownership and management, and limited liability for both shareholders and managers, the VOC is generally considered a major institutional breakthrough and the model for large corporations that now dominate the global economy. The VOC was a driving force behind the rise of Amsterdam as the first modern model of international financial centers that now dominate the global financial system. With their political independence, huge maritime and financial power, Republican period Amsterdam and other Dutch cities, unlike their southern Netherlandish cousins and predecessors such as Burgundian rule Bruges and Habsburg rule Antwerp, could control crucial resources and markets directly, sending their combined fleets to almost all quarters of the globe. During the 17th century and most of the 18th century, Amsterdam had been the most influential financial center of the world. The VOC also played a major role in the creation of the world's first fully functioning financial market, with the birth of a fully-fledged capital market. The Dutch were also the first who effectively used a fully-fledged capital market including the bond market and the stock market to finance companies such as the VOC and the WIC. It was in the 17th century Dutch Republic that the global securities market began to take on its modern form. 
and it was in Amsterdam that the important institutional innovations such as publicly traded companies, transnational corporations, capital markets including bond markets and stock markets, central banking system, investment banking system, and investment funds, mutual funds were systematically operated for the first time in history. In 1602 the VOC established an exchange in Amsterdam where VOC stock and bonds could be traded in a secondary market. The VOC undertook the world's first recorded IPO in the same year. The Amsterdam Stock Exchange Amsterdamsche Beurs or Beurs van Hendrik de Keizer in Dutch was also the world's first fully-fledged stock exchange. While the Italian city-states produced first formal bond markets, they didn't develop the other ingredient necessary to produce a fully-fledged capital market, the formal stock market. The Dutch East India Company VOC became the first company to offer shares of stock. The dividend averaged around 18% of capital over the course of the company's 200-year existence. The launch of the Amsterdam Stock Exchange by the VOC in the early 1600s, has long been recognized as the origin of modern stock exchanges that specialize in creating and sustaining secondary markets in the securities such as bonds and shares of stock issued by corporations. Dutch investors were the first to trade their shares at a regular stock exchange. The process of buying and selling these shares of stock in the VOC became the basis of the first official formal stock market in history. It was in the Dutch Republic that the early techniques of stock market manipulation were developed. The Dutch pioneered stock futures, stock options, short selling, bear rates, debt equity swaps, and other speculative instruments. Amsterdam businessman Joseph de la Vega's Confusion of Confusions 1688 was the earliest book about stock trading. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Impacts on social, economic, financial, political and military history of the Netherlands. The idea of a highly competitive and organized active mainly in Greater India but headquartered in the United Provinces of the Netherlands Dutch government-backed privately financed military commercial enterprise was the wartime brainchild of the leading Republican statesman Johan van Oldenbarnveldt and the States General in the late 1590s. In 1602, the United East India Company VOC was formed by a government-directed consolidation, amalgamation of several rival Dutch trading companies or the so-called Voorkompagnien. It was a time when the newly formed Dutch Republic was in the midst of their 80-year-long revolutionary global war against the mighty Spanish Empire and Iberian Union 1579 to 1648 and therefore, from the beginning, the VOC was not only a business enterprise but also an instrument of war. In other words, the VOC was a fully functioning military political commercial complex in its own right rather than a pure trading company or shipping company. In the early modern period, the VOC was the largest private employer in the Low Countries. The company was a major force behind the financial revolution and economic miracle of the young Dutch Republic in the 17th century. During their golden age, the Dutch Republic or the Northern Netherlands, as the resource poor and obscure cousins of the more urbanized Southern Netherlands, rose to become the world's leading economic and financial superpower. Despite its lack of natural resources except for water and wind power and its comparatively modest size and population, the Dutch Republic dominated global market in many advanced industries such as shipbuilding, shipping, water engineering, printing and publishing, map making, pulp and paper, lens making, sugarcane refining, overseas investment, financial services, and international trade. The Dutch Republic was an early industrialized nation-state in its golden age. The 17th-century Dutch mechanical innovations, inventions such as wind-powered sawmills and Hollander beaters helped revolutionize shipbuilding and paper including pulp industries in the early modern period. The VOC's shipyards also contributed greatly to the Dutch domination of global shipbuilding and shipping industries during the 1600s. By 17th-century standards, 
As Richard Unger affirms, Dutch shipbuilding was a massive industry and larger than any shipbuilding industry which had preceded it. By the 1670s the size of the Dutch merchant fleet probably exceeded the combined fleets of England, France, Spain, Portugal, and Germany. Until the mid 1700s, the economic system of the Dutch Republic, including its financial system, was the most advanced and sophisticated ever seen in history. From about 1600 to 1720, the Dutch had the highest per capita income in the world, at least double that of neighboring countries at the time. However, in a typical multicultural society of the Netherlands, home to 1 million citizens with roots in the former colonies Indonesia, Suriname and the Antilles, the VOC's history and especially its dark side has always been a potential source of controversy. In 2006 when the Dutch Prime Minister Jan Peter Balkinende referred to the pioneering entrepreneurial spirit and work ethics of the Dutch people and Dutch Republic in their golden age, he coined the term, VOC mentality, VOC mentalitate in Dutch. For Balkinende, the VOC represented Dutch business acumen, entrepreneurship, adventurous spirit, and decisiveness. However, it unleashed a wave of criticism, since such romantic views about the Dutch Golden Age ignores the inherent historical associations with colonialism, exploitation and violence. Balkinende later stressed that, "...it had not been his intention to refer to that at all." But in spite of criticisms, the "...VOC mentality." as a characteristic of the selective historical perspective on the Dutch Golden Age, has been considered a key feature of Dutch cultural policy for many years. <laughs> <laughs> Roles in the history of the global economy and international relations The VOC was a transcontinental employer and an early pioneer of outward foreign direct investment at the dawn of modern capitalism. In his book The Ecology of Money, Debt, Growth, and Sustainability 2013, Adrian Kuzminski notes, "...the Dutch, it seems, more than anyone in the West since the palmy days of ancient Rome, had more money than they knew what to do with." They discovered, unlike the Romans, that the best use of money was to make more money. They invested it, mostly in overseas ventures, utilizing the innovation of the joint stock company in which private investors could purchase shares, the most famous being the Dutch East India Company. The VOC's intercontinental activities played a major role to the Dutch Republic's prosperity, as well as it could awaken socio-economic dynamism elsewhere. Wherever Dutch capital went, urban features were developed, economic activities expanded, new industries established, new jobs created, trading companies operated, swamps drained, mines opened, forests exploited, canals constructed, mills turned, and ships were built. In the early modern period, the Dutch were pioneering capitalists who raised the commercial and industrial potential of underdeveloped or undeveloped lands whose resources they exploited, whether for better or worse. For example, the native economies of pre-VOC-era Taiwan and South Africa were virtually undeveloped or were in almost primitive states. In many way, recorded economic history of Taiwan and South Africa began with the Golden Age of the VOC in the 17th century. It was VOC people who established and developed the first urban areas in the history of Taiwan Tainan, and South Africa including Cape Town, Stellenbosch, and Swellendam. The VOC existed for almost 200 years from its founding in 1602, when the States General of the Netherlands granted it a 21-year monopoly over Dutch operations in Asia until its demise in 1796. During those two centuries between 1602 and 1796, the VOC sent almost a million Europeans to work in the Asia trade on 4,785 ships, and netted for their efforts more than 2.5 million tons of Asian trade goods. 
By contrast, the rest of Europe combined sent only 882,412 people from 1500 to 1795, and the fleet of the English later British East India Company, the VOC's nearest competitor, was a distant second to its total traffic with 2,690 ships and a mere one-fifth the tonnage of goods carried by the VOC. The VOC enjoyed huge profits from its spice monopoly through most of the 17th century. By 1669, the VOC was the richest company the world had ever seen, with over 150 merchant ships, 40 warships, 50,000 employees, a private army of 10,000 soldiers, and a dividend payment of 40% on the original investment. In terms of military political history, the VOC, along with the Dutch West India Company was seen as the international arm of the Dutch Republic and the symbolic power of the Dutch Empire. The VOC was historically a military political economic complex rather than a pure trading company or shipping company. The government-backed but privately financed company was effectively a state in its own right, or a state within another state. For almost 200 years of its existence, the VOC was a key non-state geopolitical player in Eurasia. The company was much an unofficial representative of the States General of the United Provinces in foreign relations of the Dutch Republic with many states, especially Dutch-Asian relations. The company's territories were even larger than some countries. The VOC had seminal influences on the modern history of many countries and territories around the world such as New Netherland, New York, Indonesia, Malaysia, India, Sri Lanka, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Mauritius, Taiwan, and Japan. Topic: <laughs> Artistic, scientific, technological, and cultural legacies of the VOC world. Topic. VOC World as an information, knowledge exchange network in the Dutch maritime world system During the Dutch Golden Age, the Dutch, using their expertise in doing business, cartography, shipbuilding, seafaring and navigation, travelled to the far corners of the world, leaving their language embedded in the names of many places. Dutch exploratory voyages revealed largely unknown landmasses to the civilized world and put their names on the world map. During the Golden Age of Dutch exploration c. 1590s to 1720s and the Golden Age of Netherlandish cartography c. 1570s to 1670s, Dutch-speaking navigators, explorers, and cartographers were the undisputed firsts to chart, map many hitherto largely unknown regions of the earth and the sky. The Dutch came to dominate the map-making and map-printing industry by virtue of their own travels, trade ventures, and widespread commercial networks. As Dutch ships reached into the unknown corners of the globe, Dutch cartographers incorporated new geographical discoveries into their work. Instead of using the information themselves secretly, they published it, so the maps multiplied freely. For almost 200 years, the Dutch dominated world trade. Dutch ships carried goods, but they also opened up opportunities for the exchange of knowledge. The commercial networks of the Dutch transnational companies, i.e. the VOC and West India Company GWIC, provided an infrastructure which was accessible to people with a scholarly interest in the exotic world. The VOC's bookkeeper Hendrik Hamel was the first known European, Westerner to experience first-hand and write about Jose on era Korea. In his report published in the Dutch Republic in 1666 Hendrik Hamel described his adventures on the Korean peninsula and gave the first accurate description of daily life of Koreans to the Western world. The VOC trade post on Dejima, an artificial island off the coast of Nagasaki, was for more than 200 years the only place where Europeans were permitted to trade with Japan. 
Rangaku literally Dutch learning, and by extension Western learning, is a body of knowledge developed by Japan through its contacts with the Dutch enclave of Dejima, which allowed Japan to keep abreast of Western technology and medicine in the period when the country was closed to foreigners, 1641–1853, because of the Tokugawa shogunate's policy of national isolation Sokoku. Topic: Influences on Dutch Golden Age art. From 1609, the VOC had a trading post in Japan, Harado, Nagasaki, which used local paper for its own administration. However, the paper was also traded to the VOC's other trading posts and even the Dutch Republic. Many impressions of the Dutch Golden Age artist Rembrandt's prints were done on Japanese paper. From about 1647 Rembrandt sought increasingly to introduce variation into his prints by using different sorts of paper, and printed most of his plates regularly on Japanese paper. He also used the paper for his drawings. The Japanese paper types, which was actually imported from Japan by the VOC, attracted Rembrandt with its warm, yellowish color. They are often smooth and shiny, whilst Western paper has a more rough and matte surface. Moreover, the VOCs imported Chinese export porcelain and Japanese export porcelain wares are often depicted in many Dutch Golden Age genre paintings, especially in Jan Vermeer's paintings. <laughs> Formation of early modern religious communities and ethnic groups within the VOC world Topic. Contributions in the Age of Exploration The Dutch East India Company was also a major force behind the Golden Age of Dutch Exploration and Discovery c. 1590s to 1720s. The VOC funded exploratory voyages such as those led by Willem Jansoon, Doofken, Henry Hudson, Harve Main, and Abel Tasman revealed largely unknown landmasses to the civilized world. Also, during the golden age of Dutch Netherlandish cartography, c. 1570s to 1670s, VOC navigators, explorers, and cartographers helped shape cartographic and geographic knowledge of the modern-day world. Topic: Harve Main's exploratory voyage and role in the formation of New Netherland. In 1609, English sea captain and explorer Henry Hudson was hired by the VOC émigrés running the VOC located in Amsterdam to find a northeast passage to Asia, sailing around Scandinavia and Russia. He was turned back by the ice of the Arctic in his second attempt, so he sailed west to seek a northwest passage rather than return home. He ended up exploring the waters off the east coast of North America aboard the Vliboot Harve Main. His first landfall was at Newfoundland and the second at Cape Cod. Hudson believed that the passage to the Pacific Ocean was between the St. Lawrence River and Chesapeake Bay, so he sailed south to the bay then turned northward, traveling close along the shore. He first discovered Delaware Bay and began to sail upriver looking for the passage. This effort was foiled by Sandy Shoals, and the Harve Main continued north. After passing Sandy Hook, Hudson and his crew entered the Narrows into the upper New York Bay, and beknownst to Hudson, the Narrows had already been discovered in 1524 by explorer Giovanni da Verrazzano. Today, the bridge spanning them is named after him. Hudson believed that he had found the continental water route, so he sailed up the major river which later bore his name, the Hudson. He found the water too shallow to proceed several days later, at the site of present day Troy, New York. Upon returning to the Netherlands, Hudson reported that he had found a fertile land and an amicable people willing to engage his crew in small scale bartering of furs, trinkets, clothes, and small manufactured goods. His report was first published in 1611 by Emmanuel van Meteren, an Antwerp emigre and the Dutch consul at London. 
This stimulated interest in exploiting this new trade resource, and it was the catalyst for Dutch merchant traders to fund more expeditions. In 1611–12, the Admiralty of Amsterdam sent two covert expeditions to find a passage to China with the yachts Crane and Voss, captained by Jan Cornelis May and Simon Willems Cat, respectively. In four voyages made between 1611 and 1614, the area between present-day Maryland and Massachusetts was explored, surveyed, and charted by Adrian Bloch, Hendrik Christiansen, and Cornelius Jacobson May. The results of these explorations, surveys, and charts made from 1609 through 1614 were consolidated in Bloch's map, which used the name New Netherland for the first time. Dutch discovery, exploration, and mapping of mainland Australia, Tasmania, New Zealand, and various islands In terms of world history of geography and exploration, the VOC can be credited with putting most of Australia's coast then Hollandia Nova and other names on the world map, between 1606 and 1756. While Australia's territory originally known as New Holland never became an actual Dutch settlement or colony, Dutch navigators were the first to undisputedly explore and map Australian coastline. In the 17th century, the VOC's navigators and explorers charted almost three-quarters of Australia's coastline, except its east coast. The Dutch ship, Doofken, led by Willem Jansoon, made the first documented European landing in Australia in 1606. Although a theory of Portuguese discovery in the 1520s exists, it lacks definitive evidence. Precedence of discovery has also been claimed for China, France, Spain, India, and even Phoenicia. Hendrik Brouwer's discovery of the Brouwer route, that sailing east from the Cape of Good Hope until land was sighted and then sailing north along the west coast of Australia was a much quicker route than around the coast of the Indian Ocean, made Dutch landfalls on the west coast inevitable. The first such landfall was in 1616, when Dirk Hartog landed at Cape Inscription on what is now known as Dirk Hartog Island, off the coast of Western Australia, and left behind an inscription on a pewter plate. In 1697 the Dutch captain Willem de Vlaming landed on the island and discovered Hartog's plate. He replaced it with one of his own, which included a copy of Hartog's inscription, and took the original plate home to Amsterdam, where it is still kept in the Rijksmuseum Amsterdam. In 1627, the VOC's explorers François Thiessen and Peter Knights discovered the south coast of Australia and charted about 1,800 kilometres of it between Cape Lewin and the Knights Archipelago. François Thiessen, captain of the ship T. Golden Zeepart, the Golden Seahorse, sailed to the east as far as Sejuna in South Australia. The first known ship to have visited the area is the Lewin Lioness, a Dutch vessel that charted some of the nearby coastline in 1622. The log of the Lewin has been lost, so very little is known of the voyage. However, the land discovered by the Lewin was recorded on a 1627 map by Hessel Gerritz, Kart van Land van Dendracht, chart of the land of Eendracht, which appears to show the coast between present-day Hamlin Bay and Point Dontracasto. Part of Thiessen's map shows the islands St. Francis and St. Peter, now known collectively with their respective groups as the Knights Archipelago. Thiessen's observations were included as soon as 1628 by the VOC cartographer Hessel Gerritz in a chart of the Indies and New Holland. This voyage defined most of the southern coast of Australia and discouraged the notion that New Holland, as it was then known, was linked to Antarctica. In 1642, Abel Tasman sailed from Mauritius and on 24 November, sighted Tasmania. He named Tasmania Anthunage van Diemen's Land anglicised as Van Diemen's Land, after Anthony van Diemen, the VOC's Governor-General, who had commissioned his voyage. It was officially renamed Tasmania in honour of its first European discoverer on 1 January 1856. In 1642, during the same expedition, Tasman's crew discovered and charted New Zealand's coastline. 
They were the first Europeans known to reach New Zealand. Tasman anchored at the northern end of the South Island in Golden Bay he named it Murderers Bay in December 1642 and sailed northward to Tonga following a clash with local Maori. Tasman sketched sections of the two main island's west coasts. Tasman called them Staten Land, after the States General of the Netherlands, and that name appeared on his first maps of the country. In 1645, Dutch cartographers changed the name to Nova Zeelandia in Latin, from Nieuw Zeeland, after the Dutch province of Zeeland. It was subsequently anglicised as New Zealand by James Cook. Various claims have been made that New Zealand was reached by other non Polynesian voyagers before Tasman, but these are not widely accepted. VOC-sponsored inland exploration and mapping of Southern Africa Criticism In spite of the VOC's historic successes and contributions, the company has long been criticized for its quasi-absolute commercial monopoly, colonialism, exploitation including use of slave labor, slave trade, use of violence, environmental destruction including deforestation, and overly bureaucratic in organizational structure. VOC colonialism, monopoly policy and users of violence <inaudible> Dutch slave trade and slavery under the VOC colonial rule By the time the settlement was established at the Cape in 1652, the VOC already had a long experience of practicing slavery in the East Indies. Jan van Riebeek concluded within two months of the establishment of the Cape settlement that slave labor would be needed for the hardest and dirtiest work. Initially, the VOC considered enslaving men from the indigenous Khoikhoi population, but the idea was rejected on the grounds that such a policy would be both costly and dangerous. Most Khoikhoi had chosen not to labor for the Dutch because of low wages and harsh conditions. In the beginning, the settlers traded with the Khoikhoi but the harsh working conditions and low wages imposed by the Dutch led to a series of wars. The European population remained under 200 during the settlement's first five years, and war against neighbours numbering more than 20,000 would have been foolhardy. Moreover, the Dutch feared that Khoikhoi people, if enslaved, could always escape into the local community, whereas foreigners would find it much more difficult to elude their masters. Between 1652 and 1657, a number of unsuccessful attempts were made to obtain men from the Dutch East Indies and from Mauritius. In 1658, however, the VOC landed two shiploads of slaves at the Cape, one containing more than 200 people brought from Dahomey later Benin, the second with almost 200 people, most of them children, captured from a Portuguese slaver off the coast of Angola. Except for a few individuals, these were to be the only slaves ever brought to the Cape from West Africa. From 1658 to the end of the company's rule, many more slaves were brought regularly to the Cape in various ways, chiefly by company-sponsored slaving voyages and slaves brought to the Cape by its return fleets. From these sources and by natural growth, the slave population increased from zero in 1652 to about 1,000 by 1700. During the 18th century, the slave population increased dramatically to 16,839 by 1795. After the slave trade was initiated, all of the slaves imported into the Cape until the British stopped the trade in 1807 were from East Africa, Mozambique, Madagascar, and South and Southeast Asia. Large numbers were brought from India, Ceylon, and the Indonesian archipelago. Prisoners from other countries in the VOC's empire were also enslaved. 
the slave population, which exceeded that of the European settlers until the first quarter of the 19th century, was overwhelmingly male and was thus dependent on constant imports of new slaves to maintain and to augment its size. By the 1660s, the Cape settlement was importing slaves from India, Malaya, Malaysia, and Madagascar to work on the farms. Conflict between Dutch farmers and Khoikhoi broke out once it became clear to the latter that the Dutch were there to stay and that they intended to encroach on the lands of the pastoralists. In 1659 Doman, a Khoikhoi who had worked as a translator for the Dutch and had even travelled to Java, led an armed attempt to expel the Dutch from the Cape Peninsula. The attempt was a failure, although warfare dragged on until an inconclusive peace was established a year later. During the following decade, pressure on the Khoikhoi grew as more of the Dutch became free burghers, expanded their landholdings, and sought pastureland for their growing herds. War broke out again in 1673 and continued until 1677, when Khoikhoi resistance was destroyed by a combination of superior European weapons and Dutch manipulation of divisions among the local people. Thereafter, Khoikhoi society in the Western Cape disintegrated. Some people found jobs as shepherds on European farms, others rejected foreign rule and moved away from the Cape. The final blow for most came in 1713 when a Dutch ship brought smallpox to the Cape. Hitherto unknown locally, the disease ravaged the remaining Khoikhoi, killing 90% of the population. Throughout the 18th century, the settlement continued to expand through internal growth of the European population and the continued importation of slaves. The approximately 3,000 Europeans and slaves at the Cape in 1700 had increased by the end of the century to nearly 20,000 Europeans, and approximately 25,000 slaves. Cultural depictions of people and things associated with the VOC Batavia, a shipwreck on the Houtman Abrolis in 1629, made famous by the subsequent mutiny and massacre that took place among the survivors. See also Batavia opera. Flying Dutchman, a legendary ghost ship in several maritime myths, likely to have originated from the 17th century golden age of the VOC. Hansken, a female Asian elephant from Dutch Ceylon. The young elephant Hansken was brought to Amsterdam in 1637, aboard a VOC ship. Dutch Golden Age artist Rembrandt made some historical drawings of Hansken. Batavia, Dutch East Indies, 1650s, 1660s paintings of scenes from everyday life by Dutch Golden Age painter Andries Beekman, one of the few painters who travelled to the Dutch East Indies in the 17th century. Cosmos, a personal voyage, in the sixth episode Traveller's Tales of the popular documentary TV series Cosmos 1980, American astronomer Carl Sagan, who also served as host, took a look at the voyage to Jupiter and Saturn, and compared these events with the adventuring spirit of the Dutch Golden Age explorers including the VOC's navigators. The Sino-Dutch War 1661-2000 Chinese historical drama film. The film is loosely based on the life of Koxinger and focuses on his battle with the VOC for control of Dutch Formosa at the siege of Fort Zeelandia. Ocean's 12, a 2004 American comedy heist film inspired by the historical story from the VOC's IPO and the first shares of stock ever traded publicly in history. The VOC's stock certificate is the focused heist by the burglars in the movie. The Thousand Autumns of Jacob de Zoot, 2010 historical novel by British author David Mitchell. My Father's Islands, Abel Tasman's Heroic Voyages, a 2012 juvenile fiction by Christabel Mattingly, written from the perspective of Tasman's young daughter, Klausjen. The fictional story was inspired by a 1637 painting of the Tasman family by the Dutch Golden Age painter Jacob Gerritz. CUYP, one of the treasures of the National Library of Australia. 
the Tsar Carpenter, a cultural depiction of Tsar Peter the Great Peter I of Russia in his undercover visit to the Dutch Republic as part of the Grand Embassy Mission 1697 when Peter the Great wanted to learn more about the Dutch Republic's sea power, he came to study seamanship, shipbuilding industry and carpentry in Amsterdam and Zaandam Sardam. Through the agency of Nicolaas Witsen, mayor of Amsterdam and an expert on Russia, Tsar Peter I worked as a ship's carpenter in the VOC's shipyards in Holland. See also Tsar und Zimmermann opera and the Tsar and the Carpenter film. Mega corporation or mega corporation, a quasi fictional term, concept, derived from the combination of the prefix mega with the word corporation, possibly inspired by the VOC's history. It refers to a quasi fictional corporation that is a massive conglomerate, possessing quasi governmental powers and holding monopolistic control over markets. Black Swan Theory, a metaphor or meta theory of science popularized by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. It was possibly inspired by Willem de Vlaming's 1697 discovery. De Vlaming was the first known European, Western to observe and describe black swans and quokkas, in Western Australia. <laughs> VOC world etymologies Places and things named after the VOC and its people Dutch East India Company VOC, 10,649 VOC Minor Planet, VOC Mentality, VOC Mentalitate, in Dutch, coined in 2006 by Jan Peter Balkinende Willem Bleu, 10,652 Bleu Minor Planet Willem Bonteco, 10,654 Bonteco, Minor Planet. Hendrik Brouwer, Brouwer Route. Peter de Carpentier, Gulf of Carpentaria. Jan Carstenzoon, Mount Carstens, Carstens Pyramid, Carstens Glacier. Jan Peterzoon Cohen, Cohen River. Anthony van Diemen, Anthunage van Diemen's Land, Van Diemen's Land, Van Diemen Gulf. Maria van Diemen, Maria Island, Cape Maria van Diemen Hendrik Adrian van Reed tot Drakenstein, Drakenstein Mountain Ranges, Drakenstein Local Municipality Robert Jacob Gordon, Gordons Bay Cornelis Jacob van der Graaf, Graaf Rionet Dirk Hartog, Dirk Hartog Island, Hartog's Plate Weber Hayes, Weber Hayes Stone Fort Frederick de Houtman, Houtman Abrolis, 10,650 Houtman Minor Planet. Henry Hudson, Hudson River, Hudson Valley, Hudson Bay. Cornelis van der Lijn, Vandalen Island. Joan Maitsuika, Marchika Islands, Marchika Island. Johann Moritz Moore, 5,494 Johann Moore Minor Planet. Peter Knights, Knights Archipelago, Knights Land District, Nutsia Francisco Pelsart, Pelsart Island, Pelsart Group Petrus Plantius, Plantudalen, Plantius Bukta, 10648 Plantius Minor Planet Jan van Riebeek, Riebeekstad, Riebeek East, Riebeek West, Riebeek Castile, Riebeekasaurus Joost Schouten, Schouten Island Simon van der Stel, Simonstad, Simon's Town, Stellenbosch, Hendrik Swellengrebel, Swellendam, Salomon Sweers, Sweers Island, Abel Tasman, Tasmania, Tasman Sea, Tasman Bay, Tasman River, Mount Tasman, Tasman Highway, Tasman Bridge, Abel Tasman National Park, Tasman District, Martin Gerritz Vries, Vries Strait. Nikolai's Whitson, 10,653 Whitson, Minor Planet. Topic: <laughs> Places and things named by VOC people. Arnhem Land, Australia. Groot Eylandt, Australia. Karpstad, Cape Town, South Africa. 
Mordenaires Baij, Murderers Bay, New Zealand, by Abel Tasman. Nova Hollandia, NIEUW Holland, New Holland, Mainland Australia, by Abel Tasman. Nova Zealandia, NIEUW Zealand, New Zealand, by VOC Cartographers. Orangery VA, Orange River, South Africa, by Robert Jacob Gordon. Pedra Branca, Tasmania, by Abel Tasman. Alon Rottenest, Rottnest Island, by Willem de Vlaming. Saint Francis Island, South Australia, by Peter Knights and Francois Thiessen. Saint Peter Island, South Australia, by Peter Knights and Francois Thiessen. Swarte Swan Revere, Swanen Revere, Swan River, Australia, by Willem de Vlaming. Topic: Populated places established by VOC people. Populated places including cities, towns and villages established, founded by people of the Dutch East India Company VOC. Batavia Dutch East Indies, modern-day Jakarta Tainan, the oldest urban area in Taiwan, located in southern western Taiwan Koziing formerly known as Takao or Dagao, located in southern western Taiwan Karpstad Cape Town, the oldest urban area in South Africa and one of the first permanent European settlements in sub-Saharan Africa. Constantia Cape Town suburb is considered one of the oldest wine-producing regions in the Southern Hemisphere. Stellenbosch, the second oldest urban area town in South Africa Swellendam, the third oldest urban area town in South Africa Graf Rionet, the fourth oldest urban area town in South Africa Franschhoek, a town in the Western Cape Province, South Africa Pal, the third oldest European settlement in South Africa and the largest town in the Cape Winelands Simonstad Simons town, a town near Cape Town, South Africa Dutch Mauritius, the first permanent human settlement ever in Mauritius Topic important heritage sites in the VOC World Netherlands, Amsterdam the VOC's global headquarters, Zaandam one of the world's earliest known industrialized areas and the VOC's shipbuilding center Indonesia, Jakarta, the VOC's second headquarters and de facto administrative center Sri Lanka, Gaul, a UNESCO World Heritage Site South Africa, Western Cape Cape Town, Stellenbosch, Swellendam, Franschhoek, Pal, the first urban areas to be established in South Africa Taiwan, Tainan, the first urban area to be established in Taiwan Japan, Nagasaki Harado and Dejima, Malaysia, Malacca, a UNESCO World Heritage Site Australia, Western Australia Dirk Hartog Island and Houtman Abrolis. <laughs> VOC buildings and structures Forts, Batavia Castle, Jakarta, Indonesia, Fort Rotterdam, Makassar, Indonesia, Castle of Good Hope, Cape Town, South Africa, Gaul Fort, Gaul, Sri Lanka, Batakaloa Fort, Batakaloa, Sri Lanka, Fort Zealandia, Amping District, Tainan, Taiwan. Others, Oost Indisch We, Amsterdam, Netherlands, Christchurch, Malacca City, Malaysia, Statues, Malacca City, Malaysia. Topic. VOC archives and records The VOC's operations, trading posts and colonies, produced not only warehouses packed with spices, coffee, tea, textiles, porcelain and silk, but also shiploads of documents. Data on political, economic, cultural, religious, and social conditions spread over an enormous area circulated between the VOC establishments, the administrative center of the trade in Batavia modern-day Jakarta, and the board of directors the Heeren 17, Gentlemen 17 in the Dutch Republic. The VOC records are included in UNESCO's Memory of the World Register. Topic. VOC coinage <laughs> 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 
Topic: VOC ships. Replicas have been constructed of several VOC ships, marked with an R. Topic field of VOC World studies the Dutch East India Company VOC, as a historical transcontinental company state, is one of the best expertly researched business enterprises in history. For almost 200 years of the company's existence 1602 the VOC had effectively transformed itself from a corporate entity into a state, an empire, or even a world in its own right. The VOC world i.e. networks of people, places, things, activities, and events associated with the Dutch East India Company has been the subject of a vast amount of literature, including works of fiction and non-fiction. VOC world studies often included within a broader field of early modern Dutch global world studies is an international multidisciplinary field focused on social, cultural, religious, scientific, technological, economic, financial, business, maritime, military, political, legal, diplomatic activities, organization and administration of the VOC and its colorful world. As North and Kaufman 2014 notes, the Dutch East India Company VOC has long attracted the attention of scholarship. Its lengthy history, widespread enterprises, and the survival of massive amounts of documentation, literally 1,200 meters of essays pertaining to the VOC may be found in the National Archives in The Hague, and many more documents are scattered in archives throughout Asia and in South Africa, have stimulated many works on economic and social history. Important publications have also appeared on the trade, shipping, institutional organization, and administration of the VOC. Much has also been learned about the VOC and Dutch colonial societies. Moreover, the TANAP Towards a New Age of Partnership 2000 to 2007 project has created momentum for research on the relationship between the VOC and indigenous societies. In contrast, the role of the VOC in cultural history and especially in the history of visual and material culture has not yet attracted comparable interest. To be sure, journals and other travel accounts some even with illustrations by soldiers, shippers, and VOC officials among others have been utilized as sources. VOC scholarship is highly specialized in general, such as archaeological studies of the VOC world. Some of the notable VOC historians, scholars include Sinapa Arasaratnam, Leonard Blushe, Peter Borschberg, Charles Ralph Boxer, Yarp R. Bruin, Fem Gastra, Om Prakash, and Nigel Warden. For scholarly works books and articles about the VOC world, see article section, list of works about the Dutch East India Company hash non-fiction. VOC World Archaeology Topic <inaudible> VOC Timeline and Historical Firsts The publication of the Theatrum Orbis Terrarum by Abraham Ortelius in 1570 marked the official beginning of the Golden Age of Netherlandish cartography c. 1570s to 1670s. In the Golden Age of Dutch exploration and discovery c. 1590s to 1720s, the Dutch Republic's seafarers and explorers including the VOC's navigators became the first non-natives to undisputedly discover, explore and map coastlines of the Australian continent including mainland Australia, Tasmania, and their surrounding islands, New Zealand, Tonga, and Fiji. Proto-VOC period with the establishment of the Vorkompanien, pre-companies 1579, establishment of the Union of Utrecht as the foundation of the Republic of the Seven United Provinces or the Dutch Republic 1580, establishment of the Iberian Union 1580 by Philip II, King of Spain and Lord of the Seventeen Provinces of the Netherlands here der Nederlanden in Dutch. 1581, Act of Abjuration 1585, Fall of Antwerp 
1594–1598, establishment of the Compagnie van Vera, one of the forerunners or the so-called Vorkompagnien, pre-companies of the United East India Company 1595–1597, first systematic mapping of the far southern sky in history of celestial cartography 12 Dutch created southern constellations. In the first Dutch expedition to the East Indies, Dutch navigators Peter Dirkzoon Kaiser and Frederick de Houtman introduced and listed the twelve new southern constellations including Apus, Chameleon, Dorado, Grus, Hydrus, Indus, Musca, Parvo, Phoenix, Triangulum Austral, Tucana, and Volans. These 12 southern constellations first appeared on a 35 cm diameter celestial globe published in 1597–1598 in Amsterdam by Petrus Plantius one of the founders of the Dutch East India Company and Jodocus Hondius. 1596 – Dutch explorer Willem Barent Sz and his crew became the first to undisputedly discover and chart the Svalbard archipelago while searching for the Northern Sea Route northeast passage to the Far East. 1596 – The publication of Jan Huygen van Linschoten's Itinerario in Amsterdam opened the Indian Ocean world for the European geographical imagination. Van Linschoten is credited with publishing in Europe important classified information about Asian trade and navigation that was hidden by the Iberian Great Powers the Spanish Empire and Portuguese Empire. 1598–1600, Second Dutch Expedition to the East Indies 1599–1602, establishment of the Brabantia Compagnie, one of the forerunners pre-companies of the United East India Company 1600, establishment of the British East India Company 1600 to 1874. Topic: <laughs> VOC era with the amalgamation of the Vorkompagnien pre-companies. 1602, on 20 March, the United East Indies Company, United East India Company Verenigde Oost Industrie Compagnie, or VOC in Dutch, often referred to by the British as the Dutch East India Company, the world's first true transnational corporation, was originally established as a chartered company. The company was founded from a government-directed consolidation, amalgamation of the so-called Vorkompagnien or pre-companies. The VOC was the first joint stock company to get a fixed capital stock and the first recorded public company ever to pay regular dividends. 1603 Van Heemskerk's capture of Portuguese Carrick Santa Catarina. 1606 The first undisputed documented European sighting of and landing on the Australian continent Nova Hollandia by the VOC navigator Willem Janssoon aboard the Doofkin. 1608–1825, establishment of Dutch Coromandel by the VOC 1609–1621, 12 years truce 1609, the VOC ship Harve Maine's exploratory voyage, a milestone in the history of New York including New York City and North America. English explorer Henry Hudson, in the employ of the VOC, sailed the Harve Maine through the Narrows into Upper New York Bay. He was looking for a westerly passage to the Far East. 1609, Dutch jurist Hugo Grotius wrote Mare Librum, a foundational treatise on modern international law of the sea, while being a counsel to the Dutch East India Company VOC, over the seizing of the Santa Catarina Portuguese Carrick issue. 1609, the first recorded corporate governance dispute, took place on 24 January 1609, between the shareholders, investors most notably Isaac Le Maire and directors of the VOC. 1609, the first recorded short seller in history, Isaac Le Maire, a sizable shareholder of the VOC. 1609, establishment of the Bank of Amsterdam Amsterdamsche Wisselbank in Dutch, arguably the world's first central bank. 1610, an early mechanism of financial regulation practice was the first recorded ban on short selling, by the Dutch authorities. 
1611, the world's first official, formal stock exchange Amsterdam Stock Exchange, or Beurs van Hendrik de Keizer in Dutch and stock market were launched by the VOC in Amsterdam. 1611, the VOC was the first corporation to be ever actually listed on an official, formal stock exchange. In other words, the VOC was the world's first formally listed public company or publicly listed company. 1611, discovery of the Brouwer route by the VOC navigator Hendrik Brouwer. 1616, the VOC navigator Dirk Hartog made the first recorded European landing on the west coast of the Australian continent. 1616, Hartog Plate, the first known European artefact found on Australian soil, Dirk Hartog Island. 1616 to 1825, establishment of Dutch Serate by the VOC. 1616, establishment of the Danish East India Company. 1616 to 1729. 1619, establishment of Batavia at the site of the raised city of Jayakarta by the VOC. 1619, Batavia Castle Batavia in Dutch was built by the VOC. 1621, establishment of the Dutch West India Company WIC, in Dutch. 1622, on 24 January, Amsterdam-based businessman Isaac Le Maire filed a petition against the VOC, marking the first recorded expression of shareholder activism or shareholder rebellion. 1623, Amboina Massacre 1624–1634, Fort Zeelandia, Fort Anping Dutch Formosa was built by the VOC 1624–1662, Tainan Dutch Formosa, the first urban area to be established in Taiwan 1627–1825, establishment of Dutch Bengal by the VOC 1627, the VOC explorers François Thiessen and Peter Knights made the first recorded European landing on the south coast of the Australian continent and charted about 1,800 km of it between Cape Lewin and the Knights Archipelago. 1628, establishment of the Portuguese East India Company 1628 1629, Weber Hayes Stone Fort, West Wallaby Island, the first known European structure to be built on the Australian continent. It was built by survivors of the Batavia shipwreck and massacre. 1636, Lamy Island Massacre. 1636 to 1637, Tulip Mania, generally considered to be the first recorded economic bubble or speculative bubble in history. Early stock market bubbles and crashes also have their roots in financial activities of the Dutch East India Company and Dutch Republic. 1637, Hansken, a young female Asian elephant from Dutch Ceylon, was brought to Amsterdam in 1637, aboard a VOC ship. Dutch Golden Age artist Rembrandt made some historical drawings of Hansken. 1638 to 1710 Dutch Mauritius the first permanent human settlement to be established in Mauritius 1640 to 1796 establishment of Dutch Ceylon by the VOC 1641 to 1825 establishment of Dutch Malacca by the VOC 1641 to 1853 beginnings of Rangaku first phase 1641 to 1720 after 1641, the VOC businessmen were the only Western allowed to trade with or to enter isolated Japan. 1642, the VOC explorer Abel Tasman discovered, explored, and charted Tasmania and its neighboring islands. He named Tasmania Anthunage van Diemen's Land anglicized as Van Diemen's Land, after Antony van Diemen, the Dutch East India Company's governor-general, who had commissioned his voyage. 1642, on 13 December, Abel Tasman's VOC crew were the first non-natives known to discover, explore and chart New Zealand's coastline Nova Zealandia. 1643, the VOC's navigator Martin Gerritz Vries became the first recorded European to explore and map Vries Strait. 1643, Trin Nguyen War. 
1643–1644, Cambodian-Dutch War 1646, Battles of La Naval de Manila 1648, Peace of Westphalia 1652–1654, First Anglo-Dutch War 1652–1806, Karpstad Cape Town, the first urban area to be established in South Africa 1653–1666, the VOC bookkeeper Hendrik Hamel was the first known non-Asian to experience first-hand and write about Joseon-era Korea often referred to as the Hermit Kingdom. 1659, beginnings of the South African wine industry. 1659–1677, Khoikhoi Dutch Wars 1660, King Charles II of England sailed from Breda to Delft in a yacht owned by the VOC. HMY Mary and HMY Bezin both were built by the VOC were given to Charles II, on the restoration of the monarchy, as part of the Dutch gift, 1661–1795, establishment of Dutch Malabar by the VOC 1662, the publication of Johannes Bleu's Atlas Mayor first edition in Amsterdam. Johannes Bleu, also known as Joan Bleu, like his father Willem Bleu, was an official cartographer to the VOC. Along with Abraham Ortelius's Theatrum Orbis Terrarum 1570, the Atlas Maior 1662 is widely considered a masterpiece of the Golden Age of Netherlandish cartography also known as the Golden Age of Dutch cartography. 1664, establishment of the French East India Company 1664-1794, 1665-1667, Second Anglo-Dutch War, 1665, Battle of Wagen, in August 1665 as part of the Second Anglo-Dutch War 1666–1679, the Castle of Good Hope, the oldest surviving building in South Africa, was built by the VOC 1672–1674, Third Anglo-Dutch War 1672–1678, Franco-Dutch War 1679, Stellenbosch, the second oldest urban area town in South Africa, was founded in 1679 by the governor of the Dutch Cape Colony Simon van der Stel. 1680, establishment of Simonstad Simons town, a town near Cape Town. 1688–1689, the first large-scale emigration of Huguenots to the Dutch Cape Colony modern-day Western Cape, South Africa. 1688, establishment of Franschhoek, a town in the Western Cape Province, in 1688 by Huguenots 1688, after observing and analysing the workings of the VOC lead Dutch stock market, Amsterdam-based businessman Joseph de la Vega published Confusion de Confusionis, the earliest known book about stock trading and first book on the inner workings of the stock market including the stock exchange in its modern sense. The publication of Confusion de Confusionis 1688 helped lay the foundations for modern fields of technical analysis and behavioral finance. 1697, European discovery of black swans for the first time in history, by the VOC navigator Willem de Vlaming. 1697, in his undercover visit to the Dutch Republic as part of the Grand Embassy Mission 1697-98, Tsar Peter I of Russia Peter the Great worked incognito as a ship's carpenter at the VOC's shipyards in Amsterdam and Zandam, Sardam, for a period of four months. 1704-1708, First Javanese War of Succession 1712, the wreck of VOC ship Joutdorp on the western Australian coast 1719–1723, Second Javanese War of Succession 1722, in the service of the Dutch West India Company WIC, GWIC, Dutch explorer Jacob Roggeveen and his crew were arrested for violating the monopoly of the VOC and sent back to the Dutch Republic almost as prisoners on ships of the VOC, the rivals of the Dutch West India Company. 1731, establishment of the Swedish East India Company 1731 
1740, Batavia Massacre. 1746, Establishment of Swellendam, the third oldest urban area town in South Africa. 1749–1757, Third Javanese War of Succession 1766, Meerman Slave Mutiny 1780–1784, Fourth Anglo-Dutch War Gallery VOC World – Networks of People, Places, Things, Activities, and Events Associated with the Dutch East India Company VOC. See also Governors General of the Dutch East India Company VOC. The Heeren 17 – 17 Gentlemen Governor General of the Dutch East Indies List of Governors of Dutch Ceylon Governor of Formosa Commanders and Governors of the Cape Colony 1652 to 1806 Governor of Dutch Mauritius Opperhoot at Dejima other notable trading companies in the age of sail The Muscovy Company 1555 to 1917 the Levant Company, 1581 to 1825. The Vaux Company, Pre Companies, Proto VOC Companies, 1594 to 1602. The British East India Company, 1600 to 1874. The Danish East India Company, 1616 to 1729. The Dutch West India Company, 1621 to 1791. The Portuguese East India Company 1628 to 1633 The French East India Company 1664 to 1794 The Danish West India Company 1671 to 1776 The Hudson's Bay Company founded in 1670 The Mississippi Company 1684 to 1770 the South Sea Company founded in 1711 The Ostend Company 1722 to 1734 The Swedish East India Company 1731 to 1813 The Emden Company 1752 to 1757 The Austrian East India Company 1775 to 1785 The Swedish West India Company 1786 to 1805 the Russian American Company 1799 to 1881 equals equals notes <laughs>